I grew up in New York in the worst projects in America. And I've seen a lot of stuff happen. A lot of major kingpins came out of there back in the days. When you grow up in the projects, it teaches you how to move. You learn a sense of discernment, and it, yeah. it gives you a degree that you can't get anywhere on this planet of Earth. As I got to my teenage years in New York City, I got into uh, the fashion industry, and I started doing styling, wardrobe styling for different celebrities, Nas, Mariah Carey, Kelly's, and that took me off to starting my own clothing company. I mean, people were selling our brand in churches, popping their trunk everywhere. The family that took care of my moms, they were like, do you want to come to Jamaica? I was like, no. But my mom was like, I want you to come. So I wound up going to Jamaica for four weeks. Wow. Fell in love with the country. But make a long story short, stayed with the family. They took care of me. But seeing my mom's in that prison. What up, y'all? Welcome to another episode of the RXS podcast. Today, we got a special guest in the building. Anthony, how are you, man? I'm well. I'm well. i um, excited to be here. So I want to thank you for the opportunity, Ray J, for just have, having me here. Yeah. My wife could be here, but um, just thank you for the opportunity. I've been watching you and seeing what you're doing, and I'm, I'm, I'm sending blessings towards you. Very positive stuff. So I was, I'm glad that you accepted our request to be here. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, man. Um, So on this show, we like to take it all the way back to the beginning. Okay. So I want to know, and I'm sure the people will love to know, where were you born? So I was born in Brooklyn, New York, East New York. Um, and my family from the South, I, I call it South Carolina. Yeah. So as a child, I was really intrigued by South Carolina and I was like, oh, one day I'm going to go back to the South. So wow. I always, every weekend, every Christmas, every holiday, we would travel with my great grandmother. My great grandmother was Church of God in Christ. So we would just travel all over the country during holiday time, um, and I just was blessed to see the South where I was fortunate. I grew up in Cypress Hills Projects. So I was just fortunate enough to see the whole country. I've been to like 35 states in America. Wow. So, and I was just fortunate to see the whole land of how America looks, how it shapes, and what's going on. So from traveling everywhere, you were drawn more to the South than New York. Yeah, I was, I was drawn more to the South because of the peace of mind, the quietness. You know, I love where I'm from, New York City, but I always just loved the South. It was just different. I feel like there was a connection with my family being born there, my great-grandmother, my great-grandmother, my great-grandfather. So I felt like I always had a connection there. Yeah. What was it like growing up in New York? So I grew up in a place called Cypress Hills Projects. Mm -hmm. Cypress Hills Projects was notorious a lot of major kingpins came out of there back in the days. Mm. So it was one of, considered one of the worst projects in America. Mm. And I've seen a lot of stuff happen. But also, when you grow up in the projects, I don't care if it's in New York, North Carolina, South Carolina, it teaches you how to move through life. And it teaches you how to meet people, how to not connect with people, how to stay away, how to move your distance. So you learn a sense of discernment and it, yeah. it gives you a degree that you can't get anywhere on this planet of earth. Cause you're dealing with different characters when you're in a project, you're dealing with, you're dealing with pimps, you're dealing with drug dealers, you're dealing with traffickers, you're dealing with um, boosters. Yeah. So they all have different characters and you have to um, learn how to move. So I was fortunate. Like I said, I never was in the game of what was going on, but somehow, some way, a lot of the kingpins, I just became, I became friends with them. Really? And, I don't know how it happened, just became friends with them. They took a liking to me, so they would teach me things about business, and I took that into a positive of how to do certain things, how to count your money, how to you know hire people, how to run your business. Because running a drug game is a business. So you, a have business. To, you have to have staff. You have to have people coming on time. You have to have you know product to get out, and you know it has to be a certain type of product. So I took that negative, you know, business of watching these different, you know, um, kingpins in my neighborhood and took it to more positive. And the kingpins, I would say that the kingpins back then, they were a little different than today. They would basically, you know, tell you don't get in the game. Mm. Um, they walk with a certain certain type of character. They had more character. You know, they would drop their, their mother off at church, even though they may have, they didn't go. But they just, they, they just moved a little different. They yeah. took care of the community. So, you know, we're dealing with a different generation, and that's a long story. 
But yeah, that's where I grew up in East New York. Were you ever afraid? I was never afraid. Um, never. I was never afraid of living out there. Um, I was just blessed to know everybody because who my father was, and I just I was never afraid. You know, I wow. I one one time I was in a situation of fourteen where I was in the wrong place at the wrong time and I got shot at. But that was just one incident that happened when I was, you know, growing up. How old were you when that happened? I was eight years old. I was eight years old. Whoa. I was eight years old. I never forget I was on um I was on Fountain Avenue. What happened is that somebody ran my grandma somebody robbed my grandmother's house. And I was like, let's find a person. So I went to a crack house to see if sometimes when people when people rob places, basically they would sell people with stuff. So I said, you know, maybe my grandmother's TV over there. So unfortunately, I went to this place looking for my stuff and two rival kingpins was there and a shootout started. But thank God that, you know, you know, the bullet didn't hit me. I was sitting in the back of my grandmother's station wagon. My cousin Lisa came to bring me over there and the bullet went past my head. So, um, and it's crazy because the particular individual who shot at me, he never knew that he did it. And I, it's funny, he just got out in 2018, and we kind of connected on Instagram, actually. And I told him the whole story. I was like, you know, such and such happened, and you remember? He was like, oh. So he was kind of hesitant because he don't remember me, but as I tell him the story, he was like, oh, he didn't, he didn't even know that, you know, that happened. He didn't Whoa. realize. He didn't realize. Cause that's it, it crazy. Happened, it happened so quick. Yeah. So then after that happened, thank God I was okay. You know, that's when I really, real, that's when I really found out that God was protecting me and God was like I had a certain covering of me that you know even though a weapon may form it will not prosper because yeah. that's you know when that bullet went past my head it just said Whew. and I was like wow like it did you like realize this. at eight years old like that's that was a bullet that could have yeah, killed me I, I, I'll, ne- I'll never forget I'll never forget Whew. I'll never forget and after that happened they told my grandmother my great grandmother took me to the hell was having a service on Gates Avenue and then in Brooklyn, then my great grandma took me to church. They prayed over me, but it was um. I'll ne- I'll, to this day, I'll never forget that because I just hear the shh, just the, the the it was the thirty eight. I just I just remember the bullet just passing through my passing by my head. You know, I was sitting on the left side, and he shot this way at the guys, and he just it just yeah. So your life could end like this, you know, and um, you know, just I'm just I'm, I'm really fortunate. Yeah, really fortunate to be alive, and I thank God for yeah. So as you got into your teenage years, what were you into? When I was, as I got to my teenage years in New York City, I got into uh, the fashion industry. Um, I was always drawn by by fashion. So I started doing uh, merchandising for mm-hmm. different clothing stores. I worked at J. Crew. There's a famous store called Moe Ginsburg where a lot of uh, celebrities, a lot of politicians would come. And thank God for working at those stores. They kind of moved me up. And then I was able to work at this place called Atrium, which is a lot of famous people used to go there. Wesley Snipes, shout out Wesley Snipes. He used to live on top of the Atrium, and he would come downstairs on Sundays because he lived on Astor Street. Okay. So he would come downstairs and talk to me. Russell Simmons used to come there on Sundays because before Russell Simmons started Fat Farm, um, he, was, he would ask a lot of questions. So the Atrium was the spot to be at. So just from working at the Atrium, I was blessed to basically uh, meet a lot of celebrities, and I started doing styling wardrobe styling for different celebrities, for different like Nas, Mariah Carey, um, Kelly's. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And you enjoyed doing that, of course. I really enjoyed doing that. Um, I met a lot of people. Um, that's where I love. I love putting stuff together. So that kind of kept me focused and it kind of kept me out of trouble. Yeah. I would say doing it. And that took me off to starting my own clothing company. Me and um, a few celebrities had a few clothing companies. Um, we had a clone clone called Royal Addiction. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's actually funny. That's how I found Rocky Mount in 2008. Okay. So what happened in 2008, we had a clothing company called Royal Addiction, me and Marlo from The Wire. Okay. And what happened was me and my partner split. So we had about $200,000 worth of product in the, in, the, um, in the warehouse. And once you have, once the season is over in the fashion industry, you could take it to like Marshalls, TJ Maxx, but I'm like, no, that's not the way to go. Mm. So I was like, we're going to go out of town and, and move this work. 
product basically so <laughs> yeah sorry so uh so basically my my friend um he's he's he used to work out of goldsboro he just came out yeah and he was like you know there's a little flea market in rocky mount um called the swap shop and then there's a flea market in raleigh i'm like raleigh he said yeah so he said let's go i said well you know i don't i don't know so in 2008 we took me to the swap shop 2008 Rocky Mount Swap Shop was popping. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that. It was lines out there, and it was people from different towns that would come and buy wholesales for me. So what I did was we would come to Rocky Mount on the on we would leave we would leave Friday night. Yeah. Get here at six o'clock in the morning, get to um the swap shop, get in line, get our little get two booths that were twenty dollars, and we would sell out, and then we would go to Raleigh the next day Saturday. And head back to New York City. So we did that for about four months. And y'all sold it all out? We sold the Rocky Mount stand-up. Rocky <laughs> Mount Show Love. Yeah. And this was 2008. That's crazy. The swap shop was popping <laughs> in 2008. So, you know, even though I didn't never live here, but I, I've been through this town. I've yeah. been through this town. I didn't been through the whole town. But Rocky Mount Show Love, Goldsboro, Wilson, Tarboro. Yeah. They were pulling up. Because what happens, a lot of um stores... A little stores back in the fashion industry when the when the whole fashion industry exploded, a lot of you know middle stores didn't have contracts, so they couldn't get products. So I said, listen, I got a little brand called Royal Addiction. I got a little celebrities wearing it. Uh, you could buy from me directly. So you know we was able to get a lot of contacts out here and support a lot of little stores. People were also were selling out their trunks, selling in churches everywhere. I mean, people were selling our brand in churches, <laughs> popping their trunk everywhere. Yo, so, but it's crazy because like. You guys were smart enough to connect with a market that needed the product. Yeah. And a lot of times companies and brands miss that. It's like sometimes we strive to be so high yeah. that we miss the opportunity. Yeah. So for you guys to be aware to say, hey, let's go to a place where they need this because yeah. we'll sell it faster. Yeah. yeah. That's and like I said, I, I want to say this in the proper way. The South was popping in 08. It's still, you know, it's when the music industry started, fashion industry, what I learned about the South was, so in New York City, everybody was getting record deals. Yeah. In the South, the South was moving records out of the trunk of their car. So one day I was in Florida, and when Rick Ross first got started, I met him in, I met him in South Beach one time. Uh-huh. And quick minute, he said, man, move it how you can move it. And he bought a T-shirt for me. I'll never forget. And basically he was saying that you don't have to wait. So the South, they didn't wait for record deal. The South was moving units out of their car, Master P, all these guys. And then they got a deal. Yeah. They didn't, that's what they did first. They got a deal later. Yes. They moved. They they moved. They was going from, because basically the way New York City works is you have New York. So if you go to New York City, you move your, you move your records or whatever. You got New York, you got maybe New Jersey, but the South, you got Memphis, you got Alabama. You can go through the whole South and and make it happen. Yes. So it's different. Yes. You guys, you have a larger territory. So the South, they was independent with it and they was just making it happen. I was like, oh, that's how you make it happen. Yeah. So I'm like, why should I go to a store and they're going to tax me on my products and I can go right to the streets and do it in a positive way and, you know, so and help other little other you know, vendors and store owners yeah. and whatever. So I learned a lot about distribution through that way. And then, so did you have any other business ventures after that clothing brand? So after the, we kept Royal Diction for a while. Um, I had another um, manufacturer who we work with. So my other manufacturer, you know, unfortunately, you know, we split. So I have, I had another manufacturer who signed me onto my deal and we did it for a while. It did pretty good. We had a store in New York City. We do some distribution. And by 2012, I just we just the company dissolved. Okay. So yeah, I kept my trademark and we kept it moving. So I kind of fell back for a while. Um, wasn't sure what I was gonna do. And I was just, you know, hustling, scrambling, you know, trying to yeah. figure things out. And then, you know, here we are with the bakery. Okay. So between that time and the bakery, what was going on in your life? Ah, oh, man. I didn't, I was kind of done with the fashion industry and I didn't really want to do production for a while. So I started doing a little consulting um, for a while. I was just, you know, just making, trying to make ends meet, trying to figure things out. Um, my wife at that point, 
my my wife, she was at Polo, Ralph Lauren. My wife actually came for, also from the fashion industry. Okay. She worked for Ralph Lauren. She was a designer for the. She did the golf wear. That's crazy. So she she came up through the industry, and um, so we wasn't sure what we were gonna do. So I was just working odds, and you know I stopped the industry, and then the Patty thing came. Okay. So basically, what happened was, um, Joanne's sister was making patties, which is Haitian patties. Yeah. And they were really good. And I took them to a few friends, and they're like, this is good. So I was like, this is a business. This is a product. How can we get out to the masses? So my friend, may he rest in peace, Lloyd Porter, which is Gregory's Porter brother, the singer. Of course I know Gregory Porter. Yeah. Made it, yeah, yeah, Gregory That's Porter. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. So Lloyd Porter, he had, a, he had the first black-owned I would say coffee shop in Best Eye, and I was like, "We need to get a, we need to get a garage. I don't want a store because we're not from the food industry." He was like, "No, man, you need to get a store." I'm like, "A store? I don't want a store." So, make a long story short, there was a store available. I was like, "I don't want that store." So, met the owner of the store, Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bennett actually went to my church, and I told him, I said, "You know, I seen a store, but I don't want your store," and he was offended. And he said, you know what? I'm going to drop the price because <laughs> I want you to have this store. And I was like, I came back to my wife. I was like, um, I have some news, Joanne. Um, Mr. Bennett said he's going to give us the store and he's going to drop the price. She was like, oh. So him dropping the price was undeniable, even though you didn't want the store. Yes. So we were like, my wife was like, oh, because we, she was a little nervous because, you know, she was still at Polo. I was still doing my thing. So we wound up taking the store. So wow. we opened the store in 2015. So Mr. Bennett, I love him. Great guy. Um, yeah, we still talk once in a while. And yeah. So y'all yeah. was in there slinging patties. We was there slinging patties, <laughs> slinging patties in a 200 square, 220 square space. But it was, we, you know, the, it, it, soon the day it opened until we closed it, it did its thing. That's good. We opened in 2015. You know, celebrities coming in. Um, people from different places coming in. Yeah. Um, so we had it from 2015 to two. Then we doing COVID. We closed it March 16th. I think when COVID came, we closed like March 16th. That was 2020. So all the way up in 2020, you still living in New York. 2020, we still live in New York City. Um, we were still there. Um, COVID hits. Nobody knows what to do. But we had a customer named Lisa Nelson. Lisa Nelson lives in Rocky Mount. She would always come to our store in Brooklyn. Her daughter was going to school there. Oh, 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 and she was like, you know, there's a building downtown Rocky Mount. You know, it's for sale. So I was like, I know Rocky Mount. She's like, how you know Rocky Mount? I was like, I, was, I used to run through Rocky Mount in 08, 010. I was out there. So I, I mean, I don't know the whole landscape, but we know Rocky Mount. So my wife was like, Rocky Mount? Yeah, because that sounds insane. She said, no. So, <laughs> but my wife actually came to Rocky Mount because one of my trips, when we was bringing a product down here, she came on a little trip with us. We went out to Columbia, South Carolina. So she don't remember coming down here. So we came down here, but she remember. So my wife agreed, I think it was early 2020. My wife said, okay, I'll go down there. So me and my wife, she jumped on Amtrak. She came downtown. She's like, um, I'm not moving here. I was like, why? She was like, I'm sorry. Just, I don't see anything going on. It was Sunday. It was quiet. And she was like, take me back home. I'm like, okay. So that's by, by, that's that Friday, actually. But that Monday, she looked around. She was like, okay, cute little town. Okay, I think, I, I think. So we went back. <laughs> and then, you know, we made an offer on the building. We got it. And First offer? Yes. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, we made an offer on the building. And then we got it. And yeah, yeah. So we're back in New York City. COVID happened. And then we were just packing. So, we, so during COVID, y'all were packing. We were packing. <laughs> Yo, that's crazy. Packing. We had a three floor, we have three floor brownstone. We was packing, 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 packing. You know, you know, packing. It was crazy. You know, my cousin was oh. staying with us. We we're packing, you know, and when we left, we had because we had this, we had a house for with a house in 1997. We had we had stuff for so much, we had so much stuff. Our tenants basically was like, Can you keep the furniture? Can you keep that? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so we moved down here. And um, it's been a great experience. So we moved down here. Unfortunately, it took three years to get the store together. Um, construction, COVID. We suffered a lot of deaths. You know, this is something that we don't talk about. So, you know, when we came down here three three years ago, 2020, 
as we were working on the store, yes, there were COVID. Yes, there was construction issues, permits. But me and my wife suffered a large amount of deaths. Family, um, she lost a sister. I lost my grandmother. Mm. I lost my father. Mm. So that is something that people really didn't know unless you knew us. Like we don't, I don't, we don't, I don't really show in, a, in, in public like what's going on in my business. You would never know what's wrong with me. Yeah. So we were suffering a lot of losses, heavy, heavy losses. While we were down here, we were going through losses, losses. So we were trying to get a building, do construction, and then that happened. And then y'all had to move, like, y'all were moving back and forth well, from here we, to there? Well, we, we, we moved once, but we kept going back and forth to the house. Yeah. So I kept going back and forth, going back and forth. And then my wife was like, because my grandmother was there. My grandmother was living on our first floor. And then my grandmother was there. And then um, I was just checking her. I was like, you know what? I just want to check my grandmother, even though, you know, we had family take care of her. My tenant upstairs would come and check on her. But I just felt like I need to be there. Like, my grandmother raised me. She took care of me. So I felt like I need to be there. And then, unfortunately, she passed away. So I stopped going. And then it's I just slowly stopped going, stopped, stopped going. So she passed away 2022. 20, so, yeah, so we suffered a lot of loss, you know, family betrayal, stuff that that you would never think would happen. Everything that you would think would never happen happened. You know, we didn't get sick or anything, but a lot of family deaths, you know. Yeah. I want to go back to something I heard you say. You said the tenant upstairs would check on your grandma? Yeah, my girl Danielle, she became, so my tenant Danielle, Danielle, that's my girl, she became like more like family because I met her through the bakery and she was looking for an apartment and I was like, you know, you can become my tenant. And she was like, she would come to the store all the time. We would hang out. And I was like, when things are right, you know, we had a tenant. And so we had a tenant moved out. And then I was like, Danielle, I have a second floor for you, actually. And she waited because the tenant was moving out. So we actually redid the whole place for her. Dope. Everything for her. Like, really did. You know, we gave her a lower mark. Because New York City ain't no joke of rent. I believe it. This little this room right here run you quick 2000 Sheesh. So New York City is no joke on the rent. So yeah. we gave her market rate. And she became more like family. Like, you know, I discerned her spirit, who she was. And I was like, you more like, so she became more like family. So thank God when my grandmother was sick. She was there because she went to my grandmother. She's like, your grandmother's not moving. Like she used my grandmother to dance and she plays her gospel music in the morning, you yeah. know, get her on Shirley C's on in the morning. <laughs> so she wasn't moving like she she used to. And she called me. So I ran down there and I was fortunate to stay with my grandmother until she passed. Like she went to the hospital that Friday. I stayed there with two weeks until, you know, it happened. But yeah. I, I stayed with her. Yeah. So how did you maintain a level head trying to get the business off the ground dealing with those deaths? Man, it was God's grace. And the thing about here, this peace here, people talk about Rocky Mountain, this and that. You can go down 301 in the country and find peace. You can walk and find peace. So in New York City, I lived in Brooklyn, which is a city. There's traffic, there's noise, there's horns blowing. Here... You can find peace. So I was blessed to, you know, people, my neighbor thought I was crazy. I would walk from from um, from one side of Rocky Mountain to the other side, from Edgecombe to Nash. My neighbor was like, you're not hot. It was August. And he was like, man, why are you walking around so much? So I found peace and just walking. I was walking this whole, the whole land, just walking the wow. land, just walking for about two years, just walking around, riding my bike. You know, I also... I have another vintage, another business. It's called um, Big Betty. I sell vintage clothing. North, North Carolina has a huge amount of um, vintage supply. A lot of people don't know that. People think California has supply, but North Carolina has supply. So I sell a lot of vintage clothing to New York City, and I sell it to a few um, places online. So I also started that while I was here doing COVID. But I found peace during COVID, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So the entrepreneurial thing is really heavy with you. The entrepreneurial thing is really heavy with me. Um, just watching, you know, people grow up in my neighborhood. My unfortunately, my mother and father were entrepreneurs, but they was on the wrong side of the track. Okay. Um, my mom's 1996. You know, you know, it's funny. Like sometimes you don't talk about stuff because you just don't talk about it. But 1996, my father was in. My mother was in Jamaica in Spanish Town, and she, um. I don't know why she went. I, I kind of had an inkling, but in 1996, my mother went out to um, Jamaica. 
and they were transporting, and they got caught at the airport. So what happened was when you transport through an airport um, drugs, uh, they have people on, on deck. They have the flight attendant. They have the person that check your bags. The day my mother was going to the airport, the guy that was supposed to let them through, he didn't, he didn't come to work that day. So I get a call, 1996, you know, I'm forced to your mother. She got at the airport. It was six of them. They got caught. One got three years. One got four years. Thank God. You know, I had a lawyer. My mother got two years. And while this is going on, my father was doing 20 years of state for, um, for selling. So a lot of people, like, and this is the thing, like, I thank you for, like I said, I thank you for the opportunity being, I have never talked about this in public. People may see me like, oh, this guy is a suburban guy, this and that. No, my, my, I come from great grandparents. I came from a great family. But like I said, my father did 20 years transporting and my mother was transporting drugs. So I've never had the opportunity to express this in public yeah. or talk about it in public because, you know, a lot of interviews that I have done, you know, I talk, talk about it, but they kind of like brush it off. So, yeah. but that's where I come from, you know. So when people see me, you know, I didn't come from Harvard. I didn't come from this place. I didn't. I come from the projects. I come from. I come from parents who transport. But I had a great grandmother who was. A, I come. I come from a good family though. Yeah. But out of that, my grandmother, my great grandmother, my uncles, they would travel. So even though I was living in that environment, I travel a lot. My family took me around. So I had. We had two sides of the tracks. Families, you know. Yeah. Roger is the way you say it. Is that how I sound when I sing? And I think I sound good. <laughs> <laughs> some people don't have that. Like some right. people don't have people cheering them on or telling them that they believe in them. And it's just like, that's what I'm trying to be on. I lost myself. And I feel like once I lost myself, everybody knew I did because I didn't really act the same. You try to change who you are. Mm -hmm so that people can have better opinions about you. I am a new me, Ooh. and I'm okay with that. Hi, this is Nay, and that was Nay's Place. If you want to catch more, search Nay's Place on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and RXS Entertainment YouTube channel. So the thing I want to know is, what made you not choose that lifestyle. Um, I don't like jail. I like food. <laughs> and, you know, it was crazy because when I was, um, so I was 17, my cousin, um, he told me, he was like, go to the store and get um, Ziploc bags. I'm like, what? So he gave me some money. He's like, go get some Ziploc bags. I know he, I, I know what the, inter I know the, what he was, I kind of knew what he was doing. Yeah. But I was like, okay. And then I'm running Ziploc's back and he was like, oh, I was like, oh, so that's what you're doing. So I was like, that that life, that's that that's not that's not where you know, that's not the life that I want to be in, and that's not my thing. I like selling stuff, but I don't like selling that kind of stuff. Yeah. But also, you know, like I said, I was in church, Church of God of Christ, which kind of saved my life, my great grandmother. So I was never interested in selling drugs. That's not my thing, you know. I just. And were you active in church? Like, were you doing anything? So, Victory Temple Church of God in Christ in Brooklyn is where I was going as a kid. I played the bongos. Okay. So, I played, I was really good playing the bongos. And that was kind of like the ministry of what I did. Yeah. Yeah. So, I want to go back a little bit. And I want to ask you about your wife. Yeah. How did you meet her? Ah, so, I, so my, I used to work at the atrium. Yeah. And um, her cousin Ronald worked there. And I was like, Ronald, I want to find a wife. Because the atrium was a hot spot. That's where all the celebrities came in. All types of women came through. And I was never attracted to that type of woman. Mm -hmm. I'm attracted to a certain type of woman. So what was coming through, I'm not knocking what came through. That's not my type. I have a certain yeah. type I like. Yeah. So I said, you know, I want to I wanna find a wife. I want to get married. He's like... Get married. This is 1996, and it's funny because I'll go back to that story. But anyway, he was like, "Get married. You young." I was like, "Yeah, but it's 1996. Why you want to get?" I was like, "Listen, I want to find a wife. What's coming through here? What I'm seeing is not my thing." I was dating, but 
what I was dating was not my type. Yeah. I was looking for a particular type of bloodline of a woman yeah. to marry. So he said, I got a cousin. I said, you don't got a cousin. You crazy. <laughs> so I was like, he was like, come on, I got a cousin named Joanne. I think you would um, like her. Yeah. I was like, whatever. I said, you? I don't think so. <laughs> so the year, next, the following year was Halloween. He was like, I was like, okay, let's go meet your cousin. So we went to FIT. She was in FIT College, Fashion Institute of Technology. Okay. And we walked the, from the village to 23rd Street, and if, and I met her. First day I met her, I shook her hand. I said, I'm going to marry you. She said, you crazy. <laughs> Within five minutes, I said, I'm going to marry you. She said, you crazy. <laughs> And from there, but when I met her, you know, she she had all, all black. She was conservative. Yeah. I like conservative women. Yeah. You know, so that's just my type. Yeah. So she had on all black. She looked, she's smart. Yeah. And I was like, okay, so we dated for about three or four years before we decided to get married in 2002. But what we did was before we got married, I would go to her house and meet her family and check the bloodline out. Yeah. And then she would come to my house and hang out with me and some of my family. She understand my family, I understand her family, but I got a chance to, we got a chance to see who we were. You know, we got counseling at church, but it's very important. Like a lot of people before they, get, they date, they get married, they don't even check the bloodline of the person you're dating. Yeah. Like I have girls call me, hey, Anthony, you got a, you got a, you got a single friend? You got any cute friends? You don't even ask if he's working. <laughs> What blood type he come from, what bloodline he come from. Like, <laughs> yeah, I got friends, but I got a lot of friends. What kind of friend you want? But they don't discern. They don't ask the right questions yeah. of what type. So my great grandma taught me, you got to you gotta have discernment and intuition. And you got to you gotta pick ter- ter- blood, bloodlines. So my wife had the bloodline I was looking for. I was looking yeah. for a, a particular type of bloodline of a woman. And she had the bloodline. Not knocking all the other girls I dated. Yeah. If they're on Facebook, they see this. You cool, but... <laughs> <laughs> just I needed this type of woman that I know where God was taking me, she would be there, I'll be there for her, and we can grow together. So yeah. that's my girl. She understands me. She's been there with me. I've been there for her. And, you know, she's a sweet young lady. She's very quiet. Um, a lot of people ask, oh, you know, we do interviews, and sometimes they're like, where's your wife at? I mean, she's taking care of the household. We have a beautiful 10-year-old daughter. Yeah. Um. So... We do other. We have other stuff that we do besides the bakery. We have other ventures that we're doing. Yeah. So she's not really a camera person like that. Even though Cafe Louis Tour is based on the culture, her Haitian culture, and yeah. people see me a lot. But just that you know she's busy doing other things and she's a little shy. I mean, she yeah. she will get in front of the camera, but that's not really a thing, you know. Yeah. When you first met her, how long were y'all talking before you realized she was in fashion too? Oh, because when, when I went to FIT College. Okay. Yeah, when I went, so when I went to FIT College to meet her, that's the fashion to technology. She was a student there. And I was like, oh, but she also, so the part I was lacking in the business, when you make a garment, you have to know measuring and structuring. She, she was a technical designer. So she Ooh. knew the technical designer part of how to, the measurement of a garment, how the neck should be, how the seams should be. So when I started my clothing company, you have to do tech packs. So she would show me and help me how to do tech packs. That's fire. So I was like, you know what, let's be friends. Let's do some business <laughs> together. You know what I'm saying? Let's see where this go. <laughs> and she's like, listen, I'm trying to be your friend. I ain't, I ain't trying to, I ain't, that's, you know, so. So she won't even try to go there with you. No, no. Nah, <laughs> she was like, you know. But we became really good friends. Yeah. And, you know, chemistry happened, whatever. But that's my girl, man. She's been with me, we ride together with me. You know, she has helped me down. I've held her down. We have had, you know, rough time, good times. Yeah. And, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yo, that's dope, man. Yeah, yeah. So she's been like, she's kind of been your business partner since business you, partner. I would say since she you met more her. my business partner, where she brings the things that I don't have, yeah. making sure the structure is right, making sure the taxes is paid. Let's go. You know, let's go. You know, you gotta pay those taxes. You want the feds to come get you? You gotta, you gotta pay that bill. You know what I'm saying? You gotta pay that mortgage. You yes, know. Uh, so I'm, I'm she's very she's very structured. She's very smart. She's very organized. Yeah. You know, she's very organized. She keeps things lined up. And you kind of need that. And the things that I do, she doesn't want to do. And the things yeah. she do, I don't want to do. So it's kind of a perfect match when we, you know, we're together. You yeah. Know? And I think about that, like, with um, with my wife. Yeah. It's crazy because in the heat of the moment of certain things, 
it can be frustrating when you and your partner aren't alike in certain yeah. ways, but it's like, if your partner is the same as you, where's the value in the partnership? Yeah. yeah. It's like, if we, if we think the same, yeah. if we do everything the same, if everything about us is the same, we can't really help each other. Yeah. So when my strengths are your weaknesses yeah. and your strengths are my weaknesses, that's how we can come together. That's how you grow. That's how you grow. That's how you grow. I mean, it's things that my wife do. I'm like, oh, that's how it's done. Yeah. That's how you get things done. Like I said, she's very organized. She 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 has order. She's like, yeah. Anthony, your toothbrush goes here. The mouthwash goes here. Your socks go here. Your shoes go here. She, this is the thing my wife say. Everything has a place. She said, everything has a place. Your toothbrush go here. The mouthwash goes there. Your shoes go here. You know? The car Every- got to go here. Everything you got three happened. cars. You got to go here. So and my wife said everything has a place. That's heavy. So when I'm in that, when she's not around, she travel. I'm like Anthony, like man, she didn't run. Let me throw these shoes away. Let me, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so back then, in my head. But when she get home, do you you make sure they? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I try to. I try. I, I'm a work. I'm, I'm I'm getting a little better. <laughs> you know, working on my my daughter. That's, that's another little. That's that's another. So story. does she be trying to tell your daughter like, okay, everything has a place? Yeah, my daughter ain't trying to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 that's my girl. My daughter is not trying to hear everything has a place. I am the place, and that's where everything is going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love my daughter. Um, yeah, yeah, that's my that's my that's my heart. Yeah. So becoming parents, like, how did that change you guys as far as? Moving in business because I know there's a lot of freedom. Yeah. So a lot of people don't know, and it's nothing I we've never talked about public. Me and my wife suffered a lot of uh, miscarriages. Mm. You no, know, this is something that people would see me. They're like, oh, you know what's going on. So we suffered several miscarriages, and we decided to adopt. So we adopt a little girl it's about two years ago down here. Yeah, we adopted when she's eight. That's my girl. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so one of the things people understand, like my wife is like Anthony. We're suffering. We're losing people. And you want to, because we had a miscarriage when we came down here. So my wife is like, okay, you know, we, we go through these miscarriages. And then you're like, you want to adopt, but we're trying to open a business and we're losing people. Like, how does all that, that's, because when you adopt a child, you got to take classes. You got to, you got to, they got to check your run. You know, they got to check your fingerprint. It's, you know, you can't just go adopt a child. You got to go through a process. My wife is like, how are we adopting a child and we trying to open the reopen the business, and we trying to finish construction on the house, finish construction on the store, and we losing people. People are dying. And you talk about having a child. Yeah, like, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So that's when my, that's when I talk about every. My wife is like, but my wife, she realized me. I, I was just like, let's just do it. Yeah, because you're. It seems like you the you the let's just do it yeah, person like, in the relationship. So my wife is like, so she agreed, and then you know went to paperwork whatever, and then she came aboard. But I told my wife, I said, what the worst, what's the worst can happen? I told my wife, I said, what's the worst can happen? The worst can happen, we lose everything and we sleep in the car. I said, that's not that bad. She said, I ain't sleeping in no car. This is a joke. And I said, <laughs> the worst can happen is that we sleep in the car, we lose everything, and we have to start over. But that ain't going to happen. So, I mean, I'm the kind of person, I'm like, let's go. You know? Like, right now, if God told me, Anthony, I need you to sell everything, go to California, I'm going to California right now. Wow. You know? I'm going where God told me. Like, so, people was like, oh, man, when we first, when we first left New York City, people were like, you you move you moving where you going where to Rocky to do what you got a you got a pumping business in New York City, I said yes I have pumping business I'm doing what but I'm doing what God told me to God told me to leave, it, so people think we just left, God was speaking to me before I left, so what happened was another story I didn't read you know we haven't really spoke about, I think it was 2019 we went to a um, New Year's party okay and my friend you know we went out then we got home that night mm-hmm. and then we lived on um, this place called McDonald Street so we was walking down McDonald Street. A lady was coming down the block. Okay. She had on a trench coat, white hair. And I was like, what is going on? So she crossed to go to the street, street called Patchen Avenue. We turned around, she was gone. Wow. I said, Holy Spirit, what is going on? Yeah. And then another lady was coming. I said, Do you see that lady that just disappeared? She's like, What are you talking about? So. The lady's like, you guys are crazy. There's nothing there. I don't see anybody. She's like, you guys are crazy. There's not, there was not a lady. I said, look, she was there. She, I, the lady was actually, the lady was crossing behind her. So she said she never seen a lady. 
So she said, you guys are crazy. So God said, you're going to see things that people don't see. And then he started to reveal to me that you have to leave New York City because certain things are going to happen. And it's time for you to go. So it was beyond COVID. God told me, you got to go. And I have seen stuff that's going on in New York City that I thank God I left. Mm. A lot of stuff that I see. And see, people see stuff in the natural. I see stuff in the spiritual realm. Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? So there's stuff that if you have discernment, you're going to see. And you tell people, like, you see what? I'm like, yeah, this is what God showed me. So, you know, I love New York City. I love my people. But for us, it was our, it was our time to go. And I probably wouldn't be alive if I stayed there. Not wow. that I was into anything, but stuff happens. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. So has that spirit of discernment, like, have you always had that? Yes, I always had it. Um, I got it from my great-grandmother. And um, my wife realized that I had it when we first got together. Okay. I was like, Joanne, we can't go here, or we can't go here, or we got to fire this person, or we got to do this. So she have learned to say, okay, Anthony, what's going on? Because when it happens to you, for me, everybody's different. When you have discernment, if you're with somebody, either you start moving around or you just start like getting anxious. Like you can't be in that room with that person and you got to get out of here. So she allows me to say, okay, Anthony, I'm respecting what you see. Let's go. So we have not hired people. We have fired people, not work with contractors. Like I don't even deal with my whole, and I'm, 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 I want to say this so people don't get the message wrong. My whole side of my father's family, I don't deal with them. Because of the spirit of their bloodline. Mm. I cut that whole side of the family off. Because I know as a child, I seen what was coming towards mm. and how they move. So as eight year, when I was 10 years old, I would go to my great-grandmother's house and my father's mother, she would look out the window. She was like, you know, he doesn't even come upstairs to see me. My spirit told me, don't even dwell with that bloodline. <sighs> So I would never go upstairs, and she would tell my father, you know, he doesn't come upstairs, but I knew what that bloodline is like. And as I'm older, everything revealed about that bloodline, I have seen. I have seen that everything that I, that God has shown me, they have carried out. Wow. Whatever it is, it's going to be. I'm not going to I'm not gonna say what it is, but yeah. I have seen everything carry out about the online. So if I would have got, if, if the Holy Spirit didn't tell me, hey, don't go there. You know what I've probably been doing right now? If I you know, you go up there and you go inside of a place. It's like God tell you, don't mess with that girl. Yeah. And you go up there and say, man, I'm going to go up there creeping and think, you know what's going to happen to you, man? You know what's going to happen to you by you messing with him or her and God tell you don't go up there. You get caught up in some stuff and you're not protected. You know what I'm saying? I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about spiritual protection. Yeah, Stuff man. happened to you. You know what I'm saying? You can go into something that you can't get out of. You can get involved in something that can take you 30, 40 years to get out because you you wasn't obedient. So I and my wife would tell me, I will walk away from stuff. I will walk out of meetings. I will walk out of churches. I will go, I will get away from stuff that where God told me to go, I'm out. So there has been times where you actually have like walked out of meetings and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Oh yeah. I have walked out of meetings. I have been to meetings. And but the thing is that so when you have discernment, you have to know how to control it. You have to, because me. Say so like if a spirit, something, I'll, I'll just walk out and it's interview. I'm like, I got to go. So I'm now at the point where I say, you know, a pleasure meeting you. I just, I got to go. Uh, but my wife have seen me just walk out. So it used to be where you just moved. Just but now move. you try to do it a little yeah, better. Yeah, I just move Because sometimes the spirit is so strong. It's mm. on you. You know what I'm saying? You're like, what's going on? Yeah. And then like there was a situation where this lady, she was our travel agent and we went to her house and we were in the house and a rat, a mice ran across the room. We mm-hmm. just sitting there. It just went across the room. I look at my wife. I was down on the third floor already. She lived on Notion Avenue. I was on the third floor already. My wife was like, my wife was behind me. I just, I just got up and left while she was talking. We found out four weeks later, we had an American Express card. She was charging our American Express card. Because the travel agent, we knew her for a long time. Yeah. So we found out that she was using our American Express card to book other people's flights and stuff. But the the symbol of the of the mice. Yeah. Kind of. That's like, what showed you. It showed me. It, it ran across. And I feel bad though because I just got up and left. Yeah. And my wife was sitting there like, 
I'm but out. At, but at the end of the day, I kind of don't blame you. If she charging other people charges on your yeah. car, yeah. you ain't wrong for giving. Yeah, but I didn't know what's going on. But whatever so happened. So how long? Okay, so tell me this. This was this was sorry, go ahead. No, you good. Between the time that you walked out and the time that you found out about the charges, how much time was that in between? This was oh two weeks, two weeks, two weeks later. Woo. Because my wife, she gets a statement. The statements came in, and she had all these charges. She was like, and we personally knew this lady, but maybe the symbol of the mice, yeah, running across. To me, I don't like mice or rats. No, 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 no. I ain't hating the game. I just want to reason why I left New York City. I don't like mice and rats. I, I'm not afraid to go to Baghdad. I'm not afraid to go to Ukraine. I'm, I'm afraid of rats, straight up. When I see those things in New York, I'm like, I'm out. And they have an abundance of mice and rats. So to me, they are unclean animals. Yeah. So I get when it. I seen that thing run across, I got up and my wife laughed. Like she would tell you, if she was here right now, she would be on the floor laughing because I was already out the door. The lady was still talking. I was, Yoo! I was in the, I was, I, I, I got, I was on, I, I was two, those, those three flights, I, I think I hit, I hit one feet, I was on the first floor already, I was out of there, and my wife was like, my wife was like, she came behind me, so I would, now, my wife knows, I'm like, baby, we gotta go. Okay, and she knows what that then means. We gotta bounce, we gotta bounce, so I don't mess with contractors, I don't mess with anybody, you know, whatever, if you are doing something, I, I end it quickly. Yeah, that's I don't, good, I don't I mean. play, I don't play with the devil. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't, when God says this person or oh, this is going on, I'm out. When God told me don't date this person, goodbye. I was dating this girl. Next day, I was like, we, we, we can't, we done. She's like, why? I said, this, this, something ain't right. I got to go. <laughs> and wow. I, 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 yeah, yeah. It's like, she's Did you find out anything about her afterwards? So I found, this is, it's crazy because, um, I was dating her and after I kind of like broke up, I met my wife, Connie, but she had this thing. I, I I don't know what it's called, but like in the winter, she become a different person. So one day, I went to a crib and I knocked the door. She's like, I called. I said, I'm coming over. And she was like, Okay, I got this. She's like, What are you doing here? I'm like, I told you I was coming over. And she's like, No, you can't come here. But I told you I was coming over. So she became another person. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm dealing with two different spirits. So yeah, I was like, Okay, you know what I'm saying. So I was, you know, so yeah. But I learned. You gotta you gotta move quickly. You gotta flee quickly. Do not when the Holy Spirit speaks, get out. Because you can get caught up in stuff yeah. that you don't that you should tell on you. So, you know, you know, I always tell women, I have a lot of women friends. Yeah. And they're like, Anthony, you know, go back to, hey, you got any friends? I'm like, do you do you know the do you know the person? Do you do you know what you're dealing with? Yeah. So, you know, it's not always the man. It's like you got you gave him the key to the crib. So yeah. it's not his fault what happened. A man gonna do what he's gonna do. Yeah. So if you gave him the crib, if you gave him the keys, then you know it's you know So do you ever find yourself giving them advice? No. I because I used to, but I realized that as we get older, the advice I'm giving them came from my great grandmother. So telling a woman who's forty years old with a social media that's, that's on social media, that's on, that's on Instagram, or even a guy, they don't want to hear that. I'm giving you my great grandmother's advice, who's passed away, who's hun- almost hundred years old. So I'm giving you something that you probably don't even understand or want to receive. Yeah. So it's like I can't. It's like talk, and, and I, I want to say this in the right way. It's like me telling my daughter, ten years old, about. How to run? How to how to I, 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 something crazy like how to yes. fly a plane? She she's <laughs> ten years old. I can tell her, but she doesn't understand. So yeah. I can't. You know, I mean, I have two friends who have actually listened to me, and you know, they have taken the advice. You know, rest in peace, my boy Samuel. You know, a lot of people don't like it, but yeah, anyway, Kevin Samuels. <laughs> that's another story. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hey, so so you down with you you cool with Kevin? You, you um I like Kevin Samuels because what he was saying was just find somebody on your level. Yeah, if you are a certain woman that's making twenty thousand, don't look for a guy that's making a million dollars because you are, you guys are on different tracks. Mm. Find a guy that's making twenty. Listen, if you make a twenty, make a twenty. That's forty. <laughs> What's wrong with that? What's wrong to find a person that you know? It doesn't matter how much money he's making less. My wife, I wasn't making more money than my wife, but yeah. we put everything together. Yeah. You put everything in a pot, there's something there. Yeah. It doesn't, what the, what the, does it doesn't really matter. A woman's like, oh, I want a guy who's making 200000 He got to come this. Or, you know, if he gives me, th- one lady was saying on, on um, some podcast, 
you know, a, a guy gave her thirty dollars a meal. That's too less. That's that's a blessing. Thirty dollars. Where, where you going for lunch? Where you want lobster tails? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Take a Chick Fil A. You know, my grandfather would say, take a red lobster, turn the lights off, and take it somewhere else. You know, <laughs> dip the lights off. You know, take it to Bojangles. My grandfather said, take it to Bojangles, turn the lights off, give a knife fork, see what you do with it. <laughs> that's old school talk. But I don't want to go there, but you know, we got to stop. Like you know, honestly, if we're trying to build as people. Take a guy in that makes less than you. If you can build, have a plan. If you have a plan, it's gonna it, it can work out. Absolutely. Either vice or war. It, it doesn't matter. Let's, yeah. We need to come together and build together and stop this. He make this, she make this. It, it ended yeah, it because matter. at the end of the day, when you're trying to build with a person, who they are is more important than yeah. how and much money. And yes. where they're going. Yes. That guy or that girl that's making more or less, you don't know what the plans of God may have. You could be sit, You could be marrying a... You don't know who you don't know who you get involved in. Yeah, you know. You know? I look at Jay Z. You know, he came a long way, and you know, he was on the wrong side of the track when he was transporting back and forth from Virginia. But look at him now, man. You know, yeah. what I'm saying even though he had a past, but look at this guy's life. You, did you do you ever believe that guy that was running down 95, moving drugs? He would go this far, and I mean, look at this guy's life. Look what look what he have done. Yeah. So you don't know who you get involved in, vice versa. Yeah. You, know? you don't know. Yeah. So are you saying that we should give people a chance beyond how much money they make? I think, for example, if, you know, a young lady meet a guy, she's making 100 and he's making 60, I don't think that should be a, a deal breaker mm -hmm. because that's still 160 on the table. Facts. You know, it's hard out here. It's hard out here. Me and my wife, is, we, you know, we are blessed, but it's, it's not easy. You know, I watch my mother's single parent. It's not a joke. So, you know, I have a friend, she was single, and she's like, I don't want nobody. I don't need nobody. And one day she said, Anthony, I found somebody. And you know what? She found a nice guy. You know what he did for her? He helped bring her daughter to a art school wow. an hour every day, which she couldn't do, even though this guy made less. But having that help, you need a helpmate. So we're preaching this, I don't need nobody. Everybody needs somebody because when you get older, Whatever you get seen now or you can't walk or, you know, when somebody dies or somebody passed, you need a show to lean on. You, you, everybody needs somebody. Yes. I don't care if it's friendship. I, we all need a companion in this world. So we have to start promoting this agenda in the black community that I can do it by myself. You can't. Because in slavery, you wasn't saying that. Mm. You were locking arms. Pass that pork. Pass that <laughs> chitlins, whatever you guys are eating. <laughs> hey, Bill, you over there eating that? You, you picking that cotton? You okay? Your hands hurt me. Rub your hands, baby. You wasn't saying that doing slavery. Yeah. You know, we all, we all need each other. Now you don't need each other. Why? Because you're free. You ain't free yet. You got a little freedom, but, you know, <laughs> I'm a little comedian on the side, but, you know, we are free, but still, you know, we, we got away from, you know, we don't need each other. We do need each other to build, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, I'm weak. So listen, so I want I want to transition. It's a couple of things on my mind. So the first thing I want to talk about is this binder right here. Yeah. I want you to tell us what this is. So this man, wow. So this is binder. This is the first interview. This is the first place I ever brought this binder to. These are letters from my mother when she was locked up in Jamaica. Like I said, my mother got caught in Jamaica in 96. She was transporting um, drugs out, and they got caught. And she would write me letters. She was in Spanish Town, Jamaica. Spanish Town, Jamaica is not a joke. Um, when they called me and they told my mother got locked up, I was like, what? And then they told me, your mother's in Spanish Town. Do you know what Spanish Town is? So I went down to my neighbor. I said, you know, I'm from Jamaica. And he said, what's up? I was like, my mom's got knocked. He was like, oh, gosh, where is she? Jamaica, Spanish Town. He said, what? Where she was at in Jamaica and Spanish Town, you know the first thing she asked for was a radio. You know why? Because in Jamaica, the prisons was left to right, and the prisons were out. It wasn't out. It was outdoor, but not outdoor. They were kind of open, and the rats would run. So she needed a radio to keep the rats away. So the first thing I had to give her, I had to get her, was a radio, because when you get locked up in Jamaica, who take care of you is somebody in the community. So you pay somebody like hundred dollars a month. And they'll basically be your caretaker. So you they'll get them a cake. Like my mother's birthday um, was in August. So they basically, you send them money and they become your caretaker. Yeah. Because you're not there. So you pay the family. You take care of the family. So make a long story short, these are letters my mother would write me um, when she was locked down about, you know, the life 
um, you know, she you know she was talking about asking forgiveness wow. about what she did. You know, and one one part never she said um she said I know that you mad at me. I know that you was upset, but uh, you know I'm sorry. Um, I was just trying to take a fast way to get us out of Cypress Hill's projects. So, you know, she was just saying you know she was trying to get us out of projects. So that's the route she took because it was fast. It was fast. And, you know, I did it for you. I know no excuse, but that was my reason. I just wanted to get that out of the way. You know, my sad days come and, you know, so, yeah. So these are letters that she wrote me when I when she was locked down. And um, this is the first time I, brung, I have actually read these letters in maybe years. Yeah. You know, yeah. So I want to talk about that for a second. And then I, I went out there. Oh. So make a long story short. Right. Okay. So make a long story short. My sister was my baby sister Tatiana. She was eight years old. Okay. Um, and then the 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 family they were like, "Do you want to come to Jamaica?" I was like, "No." <laughs> they was like, "But my mom was like, I want you to come." So I wasn't afraid to go. I just didn't know where I was going because I was going to stay with the family. That took care of my mom's. Uh, I wasn't going to say no hotel. I know anything, but I mean, we have seen pictures, Western Union. Yeah. Back then it was Western Union. They would mail you pictures of them, you know? Yeah. So, and I just met my wife. So I think this was like a month at my wife. So I was like, you know what? I'm going. Packed my clothes to my grandmother. I said, Mom, so my grandmother, take care of my little sister. I got to go to Jamaica, you know, see her, see, see my, see your daughter, my, my mom's. Yeah. So I wound up. So my girlfriend, which is my wife, I said, Joanne, I got to go. She's like, where are you going to Jamaica? She's like, oh, my mom's got knock. She said, excuse me? <laughs> knock for what? Like, we, you know, my wife is concerned. She's like, knock for what? I said, well, she was just transporting a little drugs to the airport. <laughs> I'm transporting a little drugs. <laughs> and, you know, they got <laughs> caught. You know, the guy, didn't, the guy didn't come to work that day. He got messed up, you know? So she was like, huh? So she was <laughs> like, okay. So I wound up going to Jamaica for four weeks. Wow. Fell in love with the country. But make a long story short. Stay with the family. They took care of me. But see my mom's in that prison, mm. man. You think America prisons rough. Imagine seeing your mom's in a prison that's outside, um, two sides, and it's open and rats are running through the prison. Mm. Because it's outside. They take care of you, but it's outside prison. Like Jamaica's like that, India's like that. So I went to see my mom's in the prison. They let you inside the prison. So I went to see her. Okay. Um, stay with her, talk to the staff, met the family. I want to stay in there for about almost four weeks. So see my mom's like that. I was like, wow. And how old were you when this happened? I was, oh, uh, see, I was around. I was twenty seven. Okay. I was twenty seven, and I seen her friends who got locked up. They were all there, you know. My mom. So my mom's only did two years. The rest of friends. Some of my friends did five years. One got eight. Yeah, but I had to thank God the grace of God. I had a good lawyer. Um, and yeah, but that was like, that was crazy. Roger is the way you say it. I'm definitely an advocate for children not starting out dating too early mm. because you have no idea what you're doing. I definitely, I dated young. I remember specifically my first real boyfriend, I was 12. Love I would it. go to different states, different cities, different area codes. In other words, she had the sauce. <laughs> And the juice. <laughs> the whole bowl was hers. When I turned 16, I, I went to my mom and I said, Mom, I think I want to start kissing. <laughs> Didn't know nothing. But I remember having that conversation with her. Like, I'm ready to kiss. <laughs> It's her face. But it's it was the open it was an open door policy. Mm -hmm. I had that open door to be able to talk to her. Yeah, date. Nobody said go out here and have sex with and bang everything you see. But what I'm saying is it is healthy to date. See, my experience was kinda single home ish. So I didn't really have like a vision of what I wanted and what I didn't want as far as a man is concerned. If you enjoyed this clip of Be For Real, you can watch the full video. Just head over to RXS Entertainment YouTube channel. You can also listen on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Just type in B-E-F-U-H-R-E-A-L period. So after you read the letter about 
um, the fast thing. Like, I went the fast route. Yeah. Did you ever think about that in your business ventures? Like, I don't want to move fast. Like, did that ever, did you ever connect speed with success as far as business is concerned? It kind of like, yeah, like, it kind of, well, it didn't help me because I was like, I got to get this popping. My business popping. <laughs> so you were thinking the same way? Thinking the same way. But legally. With my wife, well, yeah, but legally, my wife said, like, Anthony, you can't, like, you can't do this or you can't do that. So I had to learn to slow down in business. Like, when we were getting married, I was out of town. My wife was planning a wedding. I was in Florida. I was in North Carolina, South Carolina. I was in Texas. What were you doing, we were doing We was, when we had my clothing company, we were doing trade shows. And we were going around the country. So I was hitting all the trade shows. And then my partner, because um, we were doing um, manufacturing in India. So me and my partner, Zach, shout out. He lives in um, South Carolina now. Okay. And um, so me and him, I look, we had a clothing company. We young guys out of Cypress, out of projects. Yeah. Sitting, sitting in the office on um, Broadway, got an office. Yeah. Got a little secretary running around. Yeah. We think we, you know, Daisy and Dame Dash. <laughs> got our first deal. Think we all that. So they're like, okay. We behind on schedule because once you get your designs, you have to run samples. So they was like, you know what? My boy was a designer, Zach, and I was the matter of fact, I was the uh, marketing PR person. And they was like, okay, one of you guys got to go to India. I said, excuse me, <laughs> to do what? <laughs> they was like, you got to go, you got to go to India to um to get the samples done. I'm like, he's a designer. He said, I'm not going. I was like, oh. Next thing you know, I'm on a flight to India, and I went to India. When America was bombing um, Saddam Hussein, what was that going on? Yeah. When they were when they were fighting that war. Mm-hmm. So when you go to India, you stop in Paris, and it's very interesting. The Muslims are washing their feet, and you know in Paris. But the scary part was when we were going back when we got on this next flight to go to India. The pilot was like, "We have to go higher." I'm like, "For what?" He was like, "Well, they're bombing. Um, what was that country? Oh my gosh." Saddam was saying country, they was bombing the country. Mm-hmm. So we had to go higher in the plane. And I was so scared. And I never forget, I met a gentleman next to me. He said, Anthony, God is good. He said, God is with us. I was like, he said, he actually he just lost his wife. And he's like, if God has brought you this far, you're going to be okay. I was, I, wasn't scared. I, was, I was scared. I mean, this plane is going high. Yeah. And they had to tell you the truth. Listen, we're bombing, they bombed some countries right now. We're taking this plane higher. So sit back, <laughs> have some tea. <laughs> So make a long story short, get to India. I'm by myself. They pick me up. They take me to the um, hotel. And I'm there for 30 days. I'm supposed to be there for two weeks. 30 days. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in India. In a hotel. Yo. <laughs> yeah, running manufacturing. Like, did you do anything? Like, yeah, did you so go basically, anywhere? My partner, Raj, and his wife, Pinky, they family had a fact. They had a factory in India. So basically, you have a driver, and the driver would pick you up at the hotel, and he would take you to the to the um to the factory. So this was this was called the, it's called the Park Royal Hotel in India. If anybody ever go to India, go to Park Royal Hotel. Best food, top of the line, massages all day long. Yeah. So I was there for thirty days, and I got bored. So I'm in the factory, and um. They was like, you know, one of the factory workers, she was like, you want to come over to the house with my family? I was like, yeah. And the guy was like, no, no. They have a lot of, they have class systems in India. Okay. So as a as a company owner, you're not supposed to hang out with factory workers. I'm like, man, I'm doing whatever I want. So the driver, I was like, I don't want to go to the hotel tonight. I want to go to Najee's. Her name was Najee. I want to go to Najee's house. Her family is nice. They're going to cook for me. Yeah. So I went to Najee's. So I was like, let's go to Najee's house. So I went to Najee's house and the family cook. And then they all, the family came out. So after you eat, um, you have tea. And then, so I was sitting, I was, I'm, I'm sitting down and the mother and father come out. And I'm like, what's going on? And they're looking at me. They ask me questions. They're like, well, so how's America like? Are you single? I'm like, oh. What are they trying to set you up? With yes. <laughs> I'm sitting there. Because I'm like, wait a minute. The way they sat there, like, she's sitting there. The father sitting there. The brother was sitting there. The um, nephew, Kareem, was sitting there. And I'm sitting by myself across. 
And oh, so they I, was grilling like, you. Yeah, I'm like, oh, let me tell you something. The factory workers in India, most beautiful woman you've ever seen in your life. I believe People, it. You know, so I was like, I have a girlfriend. That's what I had was my wife. We were like my, my fiance, and they was like, okay, okay. But I got in trouble because my, my partner, he, he called, he was like, so my partner, Raj, his brother, he was like, listen, Anthony went to the factory worker's house. You're not supposed to mingle with factory workers. They are lower class. I'm like, lower class? I, I'm from the projects. Ain't no, ain't no lower. You can go, ain't no lower than that. You know what I'm saying? I love everybody. I don't care if you have, yeah. you have money or not. I, I roll with anybody. I don't care where you're from. So they got a little upset. So, you know, anyway, so they have a lot of class. But I came back. I lost 20 pounds because the food in India is really good. It was healthy. Like the McDonald's over there is, is off the chain. So yeah, I came back. Crazy. I lost 20 pounds. The food was good. Um, it was a good experience, you know. Yeah. I, you know, it was a good experience. So, yeah. Where, other than India, where are some other places you've gone through fashion? Um, so, I mean, I've been to like Jamaica. I've been to uh, London, Paris, but not just, you know, just passing through. But that was like my first business trip i got you by myself on a plane <laughs> going going to a factory <laughs> yeah that was wild it was wild Yo, i can only imagine how i'm by myself be. don't know where i'm going i didn't know i didn't know where i was going you know i didn't know who i was going to meet they just gave me a card they told me where i was staying and the driver you anthony took me to the hotel when I seen that Park Royal Hotel in India. I was like, "Oh yeah," <laughs> and they gave me a uh, cash reserve, so I was getting massages every day, <laughs> every day, three meals a day. I Yo, was that's like, okay. the life. That was the life. So yeah. listen, when you describe the fashion life, yeah. why did you go to food? So what happened was when I had my clothing company, you know, the goal, like you know, back then, as a lot of people, artists transitioned from music. They went to the fashion industry. Nelly, Diddy, um, P. Miller. Um, I didn't like the part of the business where you had to beg Macy's, Nostrums for space in the store. Like I met with Macy's one time, my clothing company, and I met them three times. And the buyer from Macy's, she's going to my church. And this is kind of weird. Like I'm like, wait a minute. You see me at church, and then you come to my showroom, and you give me a hard time. So you could have just said, okay, Anthony, we had a great product. We had we had a lot of celebrities wearing our stuff. But I didn't like the part of business where you have to beg stores. So I was like, you know what, man? I could, I could pop this out of the trunk. I could, if I could make $200,000 out of my trunk, I don't need you stores. Yeah. So when I told, when I told my partners, I was, like, I was like, I don't want to sell the store. He's like, what? I'm like, man, I want to go, I want to go around the, go around the country. I want to pop out of my trunk. I had a BMW 745 back then. <laughs> oh. I had a white one. And I was like, man, I can go out of town and do this. I don't, I don't need no, no stores. He was like, no, man, you got to get a store. So my boy Kareem, he was like, man, you got to stay off 95. Because <laughs> I, I used to go to town by myself. I was in Philly, Florida, Virginia. Because I just like, why do I have to deal with stores? Like we had stores. No, we had stores though. We were selling around six stores around the country. But the bigger box stores would give me a hard time. And I'm like, what would Master P do? Would he wait for these stores? So I just got phased out. I got tired of it. I was like, you know what? I'm done with this. So then you went into food. Went into food. And you were in Brooklyn for how many years? So we were the store in Brooklyn was there from 2015, 2020 in Best Out Brooklyn. So we had a great community. Shout out to my boy Richard. Richard Beavis, um, he owned the art gallery around the corner. So he was doing very well. He's doing very well now. Um, and we would bring a lot of, we had a lot of out of towners that would come to that block of the store. And, um, we built a great, like a, we had a, we built a great community. So it was our store, it was a Mexican restaurant. So when it, my store was in Brooklyn, there was nothing popping. So my mm. mother told me, I never, my mother, my mother told me, Anthony, she said, man, found a corner in America and get it going. Yeah. She, she always told me that. I'm like, what? She said, I don't care where you go, go find a, a store, a, a corner somewhere and get it going. I don't care where you get America going, but get something going. And the corner we were at, there was nothing going on. And we made that store viable. It became great for the community. It became like a tourist little destination. And yeah. So people used to talk about you guys' store. So everybody would want to come there. Yeah, when they yeah, came a lot of, yeah, yeah. A lot of celebrities came out the stores. A lot of customers, a lot of people from down south came from California. 
I mean, it was a de- it became a destination store. Yeah. So this is what I'm trying to do in Rocky Mount. We get a lot of tourists to come see the beautiful city of Rocky Mount. So I'm trying to showcase the positive of the city. I don't care what people say about Rocky Mount. I'm gonna show you what what's the good stuff of Rocky Mount. Yeah. Because whatever's going on, it's not important. We moving we moving forward. It doesn't matter how fast or slow it is. Let's move the city forward. So I met a lot of great people down here. Mo, shout out to my boy Troy Davis. Troy Davis was very helpful. We moved down here because when we got our house, we had to get certain things done. So he let us stay in our Airbnb. And we had a struggle with getting our store open with the um, city um, developer. I mean, the city, they gave us a hard time. So I called Troy Davis. Troy Davis, he reminded me, you know, Troy Davis, you know, hey, hey, you know, he's, he's you know. Yeah. Troy Davis don't play around. So I said, Troy, listen, I'm not that person anymore. I need you to get my store open. So he went down there, <laughs> you know, Troy, yak, yak, yak. You know, Troy, you know, he, he don't play around. Yeah. So Troy, he got the, he got the store open up because we was like, I was done. The inspector went past. I said, Troy, they're not passing my inspection on my store. I'm out. He said, where are you going? I'm saying, I'm going somewhere, but I'm getting up out of Rocky Mount because I'm tired. Of it. It's been three years. So Troy, next thing you know, we pass inspection. <laughs> he went down there. <laughs> you know, Troy, Troy's a firecracker. You know what I'm saying? But I, I, I love him. He's a, yeah. he, He's been a good brother to me. You know, you know, Charles, really, really good people, man. So, we've, I mean, I've met a few people down here who we have connected with, and I'm, I've been blessed like you. I mean, it's been, it's been a blessing coming down here, you know. Yeah, man. So I'm still walking light, you know, meeting people, discerning people, and seeing what they're about, you know. So, yeah. So how is the store doing now? The store is doing amazing. We opened in September. Rocky Mountain definitely showing love. Wilson, Tarboro. Um, a lot of out-of-towners come to our store on the weekends. A lot of customers from Brooklyn have showed up coming through here. I had a customer who... You know, he was, oh, man, you leaving, you living, you live in Rocky Mount. Next, you know, he bought a house here. <laughs> he bought the house that we didn't want, and he and he's down here. So Wait, wait, he did what? The house that we didn't buy because they needed construction. I have beef with contractors. I don't like contractors. So <laughs> I don't buy anything that needs construction. I'm like, you want to do construction on my wife? You want to do construction on the house and the store? No, pick one. So the house that we didn't get, he bought it. So, yeah. What so, made yeah. him move here? Well, so he didn't move here yet, but he goes back and forth. Okay. But- when you come to Rocky Mount from New York City, the peace, your blood pressure, New York City, the noise, the traffic, the rats, wow. it's a lot going on. When you come to Rocky Mount, it's like, whew, you can breathe, man. It's the fresh air. You understand? You can go to Battle Park. You can look yeah. at the lake. In New York City, you can look at the lake, <laughs> but it's still noise. Like It's a, it's a, it's a sense of peace here. I don't care yeah. what people tell you about Rocky Mount. There's a sense of peace here. Even when you leave in New York City, if you're driving down here, when you get to Virginia on 95, that air, man, man, it'll make you high. You want to fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The, the air is different. Even the restroom in Virginia and North Carolina, the restroom was super clean. Yeah. You know, the restroom in New Jersey, man, whew. <laughs> Mommy of an old crack house back in the days. They still looking crazy in New Jersey on the turnpike. They got to fix those those, those rest up um, spots on New Jersey. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, man, you're, you're, you're slinging back here. What's going on? <laughs> you know? But yeah, man, it's, you know, I love, so I love, you know, where I live at. I love, you know, on Sundays at the church, coming to, you know, going down to uh, Wilson and just going through the country for 10 minutes, turn the music on, man. Just, I love the clock sisters. Yeah. Man, it's, it's a blessing. Like, people are saying the blessing of what Rocky Mount has to offer beyond what people talk about. You know, a sense of peace that you can go through. Like, when I first came down here, I was on Sunset. Cop pulled me over, throwing my hands up. I threw my um my license out. She said, "What's wrong with you? You're not a dope boy." I said, "Excuse me." She said, "You're not a dope boy. You're not trans. You're not. You're not doing thing." It was an older white cop. Um, she was from obviously upstate, and she said, "We don't do this down here." I could tell you because you just moved down here. I could tell by your plates. I'm from upstate. She was retiring actually in 2023, so I was on Sunset Park at the gas station. She said, "Put your hands down. What's wrong with you?" I said, "You don't need my license." She said, "No, I don't need any of that stuff. You're not. You're not. You're not a dope boy. I can tell." Just be careful because when you go down Sunset, there's that stoplight you can't really see. And she said, have a nice day. She's like, you know, be calm. So in New York City, you're going to get pulled over. You're going to get, they're going to drag you out of the car probably. Or something like, you can't just you can't just run a stop sign and not get a ticket. She didn't give me a ticket. And she's like, we don't do that down here. So down south, they don't they have quotas, but they don't make money off people. New York City, they lock you. They, they have to make money. So they have quotas. Wait, okay. Explain that to me. So there's a lot of things black people understand. Like, New York City have a quota system. So the police has to pull you over. They have to make tickets. They have to. So they get paid off, like, the like city, a, a commission that's off how the, the tickets. That's how the city, city gets money off 
when you get arrested, because you got to pay the ticket. Yeah, you get a ticket if you got to go to court. So yeah, so when COVID came, New York City didn't make no money. They was locking ninjas up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> all the blackie was home. COVID, we were all in the house eating chicken. So they was like, man, ain't nobody. It was nobody lock up. Nobody was like COVID. There was the prisons was empty. Judges empty. Nobody lock up. Who you gonna lock up during COVID in New York City? Everybody home. There was nobody lock up. So the the, the streets was dry. <laughs> You know, ain't nobody, you know, who you going to lock up during COVID? Ain't nobody. So the city make no money. They was like, man, all these ninjas home watching TV. <laughs> so they didn't make any money during COVID. You know? So once COVID over, you you think they went crazy? Oh, man, they made, yeah, they made money. They were locking, boy, they was locking every ninja up, boy. <laughs> you know, for different things, you know, just being outside, music. Because when, after COVID happened, you know, people came outside. And people started doing all kind of stuff. People went crazy. So now they saw the rest of people doing different things and yeah. Yeah. Like people like I don't like to get into the politics of it. People say this like so a lot of my New York friends who have traveled abroad, they have not really traveled to the South. And they say the South is racist. The South is racist, but New York is racist also in a different way. Okay. Like I have been to like a Home Depot and seen a racist guy. And he's like straight up, I don't like you at Lowe's. In Rocky Mount, New York City. Hey, what's up, buddy? And they stabbing your back. Ooh. So the people that the the racist people out here, at least you know, they letting you straight up. Listen, I ain't rolling with you. <laughs> Keep it moving. And I appreciate. They let you know how they come in. New York, they'll sit at you at your table, and you don't know what's going on. So you know, it's you know. But I was blessed to understand the South. So to me, I like the South. It's cool. There's racism everywhere. You know what I'm saying? But you know. New York City's racist too, but they don't see it. Yeah, like they, they don't they don't see it. like in New York City, in my community, um, they were stealing black people homes, and this was by the Democrat Party. They were basically they, basically they were stealing people brownstones, basically through a third party, and this was happening through um, the leadership in New York City, black leadership and white leadership, but led by black leaders mm. who are Democrats. So people say, "Are you Democrat, Republican?" I'm not either party. But I have seen Democrats do dirt. And when Democrats do dirt, Democrats don't call out Democrats on their dirt. And that's the beef I have. Mm. You got to call them out. Call call everybody out. They they like, oh, man, he's my sorority brother. Or he's my fraternity. I don't care what he's doing. If he's in leadership and he's doing dirt, you got to call the person out because he's doing dirt. Forget about the party because we're trying to build a community. But that whole politics, I mean, I'm not in politics anymore. <laughs> that's a whole nother story. Yeah. You know? So now that you're here. Do you think you'll be planted here for the rest of your life? I don't know. Interesting. You know, God could say, Anthony, you know, I want you to go here. I don't, I don't, you know, it's funny. I have a suitcase in the house and I, I keep clothes. And my wife is like, why you keep that suitcase packed? I'm like, I don't know if God, what God is going to do. I don't, I don't know. You know, I don't know what God's going to tell me to do. Mm. God may tell me, hey man, you know, I want you to go build in California. I want you to go to Jamaica. Wherever God tells me I'm going and I'm doing, and I'm moving quickly. So if God says, Anthony, it's time for you to go. So everything we got to go. So I, I can't, I don't know. I'm going, I'm going where God wants me to go. If God said, this is where you're going to be, this is where I'm going to be. But I'm not, I'm not putting limits. I'm not putting limits on God. If God said, go here, I'm going there. Yes, sir. You know, and I'm, and that's how, that's how we move it. My wife now, she's like, oh, I love recommend. I said, I love it too. But let's go where, let's, let's just, let's be obedient to what God is saying. This may be the place. I mean, I don't, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to say that. Yeah. Know? And how long have y'all been here? We've been here now? for three years now. Okay. Three years now. Um, yeah. So one thing I want to do that I think would be super dope. Um, before we go, I want you to give a piece of advice to someone who comes from a rough background but wants to do the right thing. What I would say, which helped me, and I can only speak for me, if you come from, if you come from a rough background, try to find somebody in your church, in your community, at school, a teacher, find somebody who you look up to and try to have that person become like your mentor. Sometimes, and sometimes, some people don't go to church. Some people are in the school. Some people are playing basketball. When you're coming from a rough place, find somebody that you aspire to be. When I was a kid, I looked at people on TV. I 
watch certain people, I was like, wow, look at this person. So maybe it's somebody that you don't even have in front of you. You know, try to find somebody that inspires you, that motivates you. Try to find somebody who you aspire to be. You know, yeah. because just because you come from a rap, just because you come from a rap rough background, it doesn't mean it's over. Maybe God is using that background because maybe that rough background, maybe that background is your testimony. Yeah. You know, Tyler Perry slept in the car. That was his testimony. Yeah. But he went through it. So sometimes you have to go through stuff. You're like, man, why my mother on drugs? Why I'm living this projects? Why there's no food in the house? Why this, why this, why that? Maybe God is setting you up for your testimony and that's it's going to be your story. So just because you're in a rough situation, it's not over yet. So you have to find somebody that you hold accountable that you would want to become. Yes, sir. Go to Boys and Girls Club. My friend, shout out my, my friend Ron Green. Maybe join the Boys and Girls Club. You know, that's a great club right here in Rocky Mount. Ron Green, he's the CEO. Um, find a mentor. Find somebody you can latch on to. Because even if you don't come from rough, rough background, you still need somebody to hold. You need somebody to hold you accountable. Yeah. In your walk, everyday walk. So that's what I would say, and just keep 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 going. You know, keep going. You know. That's good, man. Yeah, like I love DJ Khaled. Yeah. I love his energy. I love. He has positive energy. He's he just always big guy. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. Drag yeah. this kid. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get on the plane. He just he's yeah. always moving. He has he has a very positive energy. So I watch sometimes DJ Khaled. I watch him. I like what he's doing. He's a very positive guy. He's, he's He keeps it moving. Is he going through issues? Yes. Is he going through stuff? But he keeps going. Yeah. You know, so I say just find somebody. Latch on to somebody who you want to be or somebody who inspires you. It could be that lady at the the school who who's a chef, who's a cook. Yeah. It could be the principal. Just try to, we got to find, we got to help somebody accountable as we're going through stuff. Yeah. And to get us through what we're going through. But it's going to be okay, you know. Yeah. You know, you may have to suffer stuff. You know, you may have to go through some stuff, you know. And, um, yeah, like Pastor G was saying today, sometimes you go through stuff where it's critical or, you know, violence is involved. But that's still, you had to go through that to get to your place of where you're going, you know. So whatever you're going through, is God just bringing you through. But you got to get through it. You got to get through it. You got to get through it, you know. And just keep your discernment up, you know. Try to discern people. Try to see what they're saying. Look them in the eyes. Try to figure out who they are and what they're about. Discern- More than anything, people say, oh, well, you know, I'm chasing a bag. Chase some discernment intuition. <laughs> right now, discernment intuition is the new bag. Because, it's, because the summer's out and the devil's going to be out. The devil's already out right now. He's a, he's about to be on these streets like crazy. <laughs> by the way, I'm going to be by nature right now. This is the, this is the first season. I'm going to be by the water. I think for the whole summer, I'm just going to be by the water. I'm going to get more I want to be around the animals, the birds. Yeah. People, I want to be a little, you know, people are very predictable right now in the season we're in. So, but I said, try to, the new bag is deserving intuition because you could have, you could chase a bag and lose it because you didn't know how to move it after you got that bag. Yeah. You got with the wrong person, you connect with the wrong business, you know? So, yeah. And you can lose it all from trying to get the bag with the wrong people. Yeah. Or lose your life. You can lose your life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's big. Yeah. Because, like, a lot of people, are chasing, chasing, chasing. They chase and they'll connect with anybody who they think will get them to where they want to be. Yeah. And they won't check out who yeah. the person is. And that person you're chasing can get you to the back and that person can set you up. The person that killed Nipsey was a person that he tried to help. Mm-hmm. He helped the Judas. You know what I'm saying? The person that killed Nipsey, the person N- Nipsey was, was trying to help him, that person killed him. So sometimes the person that you're trying to help, that person may even turn around and try to kill you. So did God tell you to help that person? When families call me, I'm like, did God tell me to help this person? Nope. Goodbye. Mm. Even family, even family. I'm like, nope. Sorry, nope. Can't do that right now. Yeah. Well, nope. I don't care. God said no. It's no. Cling. I'm direct with it. My wife was. I'm like, nope. <laughs> you come to the house? Did I tell you to come here? You already invited? No. <laughs> you bringing a new girlfriend to the house? Nope. Don't bring it to my house. I don't know who she's coming with. I don't know. How are you going to bring somebody to my house you just met on, on Tinder a month ago? They might be still boosting in my house. I don't know what they're about. So you got to check everything. I check, yeah. you got to check everything. I got yeah. a daughter. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, <laughs> I got a daughter, you know? Yo, that's real though. It's hilarious, but it's no. real. Like, you don't yeah. play no nah. games. I had a cousin. He told me a joke. He was like, man, I br- my, his sister brought a guy over. 
the guy was here was, cha- was trying on his wife's clothes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Doing things on Thanksgiving. I said, what? He said, man, I, man, my cousin, man, he brought this, he brought this guy, this guy was here changing in my wife's clothes. To why she met him a month ago on Tinder. I'm like, okay, see? <laughs> nah, everybody can't come through the door. Yeah. Your house is sacred. Yeah, man. It's sacred, like the church. You got you, you know, you to ch- check out the door. You know? So, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very... Yeah. I, you know, people see me a lot in the store, on the streets. I smile. But at the end of the day, I am like this. Yeah. I smile because I want to create a great environment. But at the end of the day, I am like this when it comes to my family, my daughter, and my wife. That's who God has appointed me to become responsible for. So that's who I'm taking my responsibility for. My friend told me one thing. He said, in life, sometimes you have to become selfish. He told me that in 2018. I'm like, I'm not going to become selfish. I'm a giver. But this is the season right now. I've decided to become selfish and focus on my daughter and my wife. It may last one season. It may last for two years. But I'm putting all my energy right now to my daughter and my wife. And my family, they understand that, that I can't see you right now. I can't do this right now because that's where I'm putting my energy right now. You know, I gotta give them. I gotta give them more because if my daughter like and shine, she probably could affect ten other kids. So sometimes it's not about you know running out and preaching to fifty people. Focus on that one person. If my daughter can inspire 10, 20 kids, then I have done my job. So my my focus right now is my daughter. It always been my. That's my real focus right now. If I can minister to her. And get her going. She may affect me. She can make maybe 50, 60 kids in her school, you know. That's she cool. swims. She's on a swim with her daughter. She just did the play Motown Review. She's on a Rocky Mountain swim team. Um, she's on a basketball team at Inglewood. Um, she's doing theater. She's doing her thing. That's super yeah. dope. And I want everybody to make sure they know. So if you're in Rocky Mount, yes, or you're ever coming through Rocky Mount, what's the name of the store? What's so the name of the bakery? The bakery is the- called Cafe Louverture. I know that sometime down here you call it Louverture, Louverit. I don't care what you call it. Cafe Louverture. You can call it KL. Cafe Louverture. We're at 110 Tarborell Street, Rocky Mount, North Carolina. We open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 5. We make the best hand rolled Haitian patties in the country. Not that I say it, but it's based on reviews. Pull up on us. You won't be disappointed. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. This has been another episode of the RXS Podcast with Anthony. We out. Peace. Peace.